uh, baada ya mahakama kusema asalie uh, rumande. Kwa hivyo vitu sikiza tu yanaendelea kwa sasa. Testimony Saika Developers at Belvi. Yeah, please sit down. So you let me record that. So Professor Ojenda. I appear with Mr. Nelson Harvey. Is she seen <laughs> You are conferring a podium status that he doesn't have. All right, proceed. Yeah, Mr. Oliver Kipchumba. Yes. Mr. Collins Kiprona. Mr. Captain Olivi. Mr. Angeloge. Kamau, Mr. Kamau. And Mr. Kimani. Last year, the Mr. Suaka appears for the fourth and present for the fourth, fifth, and eleventh. Okay, so you know, we are ready to check the ruling. You have to show the time before the second. For the prosecution? Yes, you have to state that together with So this is the ruling of the court and the issues that were raised yesterday. After the accused took play in this case yesterday, the 29th of July 2019, the defense team led by Professor Tom Ogenda applied to have all the accused persons admitted to board or bail. In the DPP's response, through Mr. Alexander Muteti, assisted by Mr. Vincent Monda, the court was informed that was informed, though the DPP was not opposed to the grant of bail to the accused persons, the DPP applied that the court of bail. The conditions that the DPP proposed are, one, that the first accused who is the governor of Kiambu County be banned from going back to the office pending the determination of this criminal case. Two, accused persons to deposit their travel documents with the court. Three, all the accused persons not to contact witnesses either directly or indirectly, and or not in any way tamper with the exhibits. Accused persons not to access the offices, I presume this is targeted at specific accused persons who are the employees of the county government of Kiambu. Certainly, therefore, the contest in this application is defined by two main issues. That is, that this court has to decide. That is, one, whether the conditions proposed by the prosecution are legally permissible, and if so, whether the same should be imposed. Two, the amount that this court should set as security for release of the accused person on bail. Out of the Conditions suggested by the prosecution, none generated much argument than the one that seeks to bar the first accused, who is the governor of Kiambu County, from accessing his office pending determination of these charges against him. Professor Tom Ongenda, referring to the case, to the High Court case of High, High Court case and Corruption Criminal Revision Number 13 of 2018, Mohammed Rosuri versus the Republic, and further anchoring his submissions 
on Article 182 of the Constitution and Section 62.6 of Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act submitted that imposing a condition that would effectively lock out a sitting governor from office is not constitutionally and statutorily feasible since constitutional office holders are insulated from removal from office otherwise than by a process laid down by the Constitution. Commenting on the recent decision of Justice Mumbi Ngugi in Criminal Revision No. 25 of 2019, a case that involves a current the current governor of Samburu County, Moses Kasaine Renokural versus DPP, where the judge appealed a lower court decision, but in the governor who is facing corruption changes from going back to the office pending the trial, Professor Tom Ojeda, submitting that this court is enjoined to interpret and apply the Constitution. Professor Ongenda pointed out that Article 10 of the Constitution represents an embodiment of constitutional principles, which, when considered alongside express provisions of the Constitution, the normative provisions must be applied, such as upholding the presumption on right to bail and innocence. He further argued that even when a court finds a section of law to be invalid, this does not take effect until Parliament repuse it, citing the decision of Justice Macau in petition number 56 of 2016, James Yasheru Karioki and 19 others versus County Government of Mombasa. Concerning Chapter 6 of the Constitution, Professor Ongenda referred the court to the decision of the Court of Appeal in Civil Appeal number 290 of 2012, Momo Matem versus Trust and Society of Human Rights Alliance and five others, where the Court of Appeal opined that although Chapter 6 was well-meaning, in that it expressed the expiration of the public to clean up our politics and governance structures, it was nevertheless necessary to ensure that the cases seeking removal or review of appoint or, or review removal or review of appointment on grounds of on grounds questioning the integrity of the office holder, the same should be based on conclusive proof of such allegations. Council further refund to the petition number 552 of 2012, International Center for Policy and Conflict and, and five others versus the Attorney General and four others, which was a dispute in which the third and four the respondents were facing serious changes before the ICC, yet they were held, yet they were allowed to vie for political office on the ground that they are presumed innocent until the contrary is proved. Professor Ongenda submitted that locking out the governor by preventing him from accessing office was akin to ending his term prematurely. He contended that a deputy governor can only act on delegated functions assigned by the governor and thus without the governor there will be a lacuna. On the amount to be set as security for bail or bond, he suggested various sums which he said should apply with respect to each accused and of which the court took note of. Mr. Swaka emphasized that the fourth and fifth accused are husband and wife and have school-going children and that the fifth accused takes care of them. Additionally, that the fifth accused as asthmatic and is, also, is asthmatic and also diabetic, hence her health would suffer immensely unless she gained a liberty and continues with the treatment. It was also submitted that they had fully cooperated with the investigate with investigation with the investigators. Equally, counsel suggested amounts that the, that he considered reasonable to be set as bail in respect of his clients. For the sixth, seventh, and for the sixth, seventh, ninth, and tenth accused, advocate on record Mr. Biu Kamau urged the court to consider that the only phase one count. Count 5, which relates to an alleged omission, insisting that they are not seen to have received or transacted with any cash in respect of the alleged offence. Mr. Muteti appearing for the DPP in defend the DPP's position mm. in seeking to impose terms, restricting the first accused just like others charged with him from going back to the office, asserting that doing so would be upholding the constitutional principle of equality before the law. Article 27. He termed the High Court decision in the Zuri case as a decision per interior. He invited the court to take judicial notice of the fact that the nature of these changes, the, the, the nature of these changes would naturally require officers from Kiambu County to be called as witnesses 
and it could thus be prejudicial to allow the first accused to go back to their office and continue superintending over them in the hope that justice will not be compromised. He observed that danger, the danger against such witnesses testifying against their bosses was actually real. He was of the view that if the people of Sambu County could go on without their governor, following the decision of Justice Mumbingogi, then equally the people of Kiambu could do so without him, downplaying the suggestion by the defense that there would be a serious lacuna. He urged the court to be guided by the fact that there is a deputy governor who can take over the operations of the county. Mr. Monda urged the court to look beyond the interests of an individual governor and consider the wider public interest as was amplified by the decision of Justice Mumbi Gubi. In a rejoinder, Mr. Nelson Avi opposed the prosecution's submission for accused persons to deposit their travel documents, observing that this fact is not founded on any fact since no affidavit had been filed to demonstrate that the accused are a fright risk. He further submitted that, as a governor, the first accused cannot travel outside the country without the sanction of the national government. Mr. Avi submitted that restricting a governor from carrying out his functions amount to a constructive removal against a constitutional mechanism that is provided for his removal. The first issue that I would need to determine is whether restricting the first accused from returning to the office pending the hearing and determination of this case is a violation of the law. The power of this court to grant and or to grant board or bill is provided for under Article 491H of the Constitution. The article stipulates as follows. An arrested person has a right to be released on board or bail on reasonable conditions pending a charge or trial unless there are compelling reasons not to be released. The essence, the essence of this court in reproducing this article is to consider what is contemplated by the phrase reasonable conditions. Under this article, which upholds the accused right to bail, the court is empowered to impose conditions so long as it considers them necessary to ensure that the interests of justice are not compromised. If, therefore, a constitutional office holder is charged with a criminal offence and the court is of the view that a condition that limits access to his office should be imposed, would it be a violation of the Constitution? In my view, since the Constitution has given the court the power to impose conditions on granting of bail, it would not be a violation of the law unless, of course, it can be shown that in so doing, the court is unreasonable or has taken into account unreasonable considerations. In li if limiting or restricting a constitutional office holder from going back to the office can be termed as a constructive removal from office, then it would mean that the court cannot apply Article 49 1H fully in cases of constitutional office holders facing changes before it, even when it considers that circumstances warrant such an imposition. I don't think Article 49 1H intended that certain category of accused persons get preferential treatment when considering the conditions that the court can impose in the interest of justice. I further do not agree that limiting the governor's access to office is an affront to the Constitution principle of presumption of innocence, for if it were to be the case, then denying an accused bail or board would be tantamount to condemning them to finding them guilty. Yet, There are many people in demand who have been denied bond and they continue attending court for the trial of their cases. Imposing conditions that guarantee integrity and credibility of the trial cannot be an illegality. In the present case, the court was urged to take judicial notice of the fact that changes accused persons are facing relate to activities that took place within their offices. Consequently, it is logical to expect that witnesses who will testify are people who work in the said county government, where the first accused owns the highest executive office, the, that is the office of the county governor, where the <coughs> executive authority is vested. Officers working in the county are at its beck and call. To ensure the administration of justice is not compromised, it is necessary to guard against the risk of possible prejudice in the criminal justice process by imposing appropriate conditions. In my view, restricting access to the office is a reasonable condition under Article 49 h of the Constitution in the circumstances of this case. I concur with the remarks of Justice Mumbingugi in ACC 25 of 2019 when she rhetorically 
questioned. And I quote, how effective will prosecution of such state officers be when their subordinates, who are likely to be witnesses, are under the direct control of indicted officer? Can the issue of section 626 of ASECA, on, on the issue of section 626 of anti-corruption and economic crimes, I would say that following the decision of the learned judge in criminal revision number 25 of 2019, Moses Kasainer and versus the DPP, the said section has now been rendered negatory. The judge found in no uncertain terms that the said section offends the principle of equality before the law under Article 27. And further, and if, if the constitution and the further violates the constitution at court ten on integrity, hence this court cannot therefore be urged to rely on it. Indeed, it must be underscored that this has always been the position of this court, and even in the Zazuri case, that is what and that is what this court had delicately opined. The submission made by Professor Ongenda that even where the court declares a law to be invalid, it does not become so unless repugned by Parliament, is in my view misleading. The learned professor referred the court to petition number 56 of 2016, James Gashero Karioki and 19 others <coughs> versus the county government of Mombasa to battle that position. However, my reading of the same authority revealed that what was an issue in that case was not an issue of a section of law or law that was unconstitutional. Rather, what was in the issue in that authority were two statutes which were contradictory to each other and the court was being invited to honor the repeal of one while maintaining the other. This is what the court said it could not do, it could not be invited to do and held as follows. There is nowhere in the constitution or in the act where the high court is empowered to repeal or honor the repeal of statutes. That are, con that are considered illegal or contradictory. On the contrary, the High Court has expressed power to interpret the Constitution and in so doing can declare any law that is inconsistent with the Constitution void to the extent of the inconsistency and Article 2.4 of the Constitution. In a considered decision, Justice Mumbi Ngugi found the provisions of Article 66.2 of Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act are contrary to the constitutional requirements of integrity in governance, are against national values and principles of governance, principles of leadership and integrity in Chapter 6, and undermines the prosecution of officers in the position of the applicant in that case. Indeed, she found the same provisions entrench corruption and impunity in the land. This is a decision, unlike the Zuri decision, this is a decision, unlike the Zuri decision of Justice Ongundi, that delve deeper into considering the entire provisions of Section 62 of Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act and weighed them against the Constitution. I find Justice Mumbi's Bogi's decision more persuasive and authoritative in that regard and thus, and thus consider it as binding on the decision of this court. As for the other cases relied on by Professor Tom Ongenda on issues of integrity, I found them to be more general in their approach as opposed to the more specific decision of Justice Mumbi Gogi, which addresses the relevant provisions of the Act on which charges against the accused persons are founded. As for the submission that the governor's absence will orchestrate a lacuna, that too is addressed by Justice Gogi, where she considered Section 32, Subsection 2 of the County Government Act, in which she observes that the governor, if the governor is unable to act, his functions can be performed by the deputy governor. Barring the first accused from going back to the office, therefore, does not violate the Constitution or amount to removal. It is intended to ensure the integrity and credibility of the trial and to ensure that public interest is safeguarded. Indeed, the judge in anti-corruption case number 25 of 2019 captured this concern more aptly when she remarked, and I quote, He is charged with basically enriching himself at the expense of the people who elected him 
and who he is expecting to serve. Would it serve the public interest for him to go back to the office and preside over finances of the county that he has been charged with embezzling from? What message does he send to the citizen of the of the Alinda when the Alinda, if the Alinda are if, if their leaders are charged with serious corruption offences and are in office the following day overseeing the affairs of the institution? End of quote. Consequently, this court will grant bail to accused persons and impose the following conditions. The first accused shall not access his office until 